What? Okay. All right. All right. Well, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the November meeting of the Monroe Historical Society. Um, I'm pleased to be here today to talk to you about the Baltimore plot uh, involving President Abraham Lincoln. Before I do that, though, I want to say two things. First of all, we all should wish our town historian, Jim Nelson, a uh, quick recovery. Jim is in the hospital in Orange Regional. He suffered a, a heart attack. This led to a stroke. And he's, uh, I saw him the other day. I saw him Thursday night. And he's coming along. He's moved him to another room. So please, if you have the opportunity, please sign the Get Well card. I think that would mean a lot to him, given the number of people we have here today. So I'd like to dedicate this to Jim. Jim and I have been friends ever since I came to Monroe. What happened was I got a job in Monroe Woodbury High School, and I was teaching U.S. history, of course. And I said, you know what, I need to get a better sense of what the local history here is like. So I joined the Historical Society. I arrived here in 1988, in the fall of 1988, joined the Historical Society, met Jim, who had been, at that time, Jim was treasurer. I don't think Jim's ever been president. But anyway, as town historian, of course, you know, Jim... Jim pretty much, uh, you know, is a fixture here. So it's it's really with true love and dedication that, you know, I honor Jim with this pl program today. So um, I also need to acknowledge two other folks who are about to leave the area and move to Florida. And they're very good friends. We've been friends a long time. Ed served on the, Ed served on the school board for a while, and Sandy Leonard, of course, was town supervisor, so we wish them nothing but the best and good friends. And you'll have to, as I indicated in the last text, you have to visit us in Savannah when we're down there, when the weather gets just too cold up here. Gee, surprise, surprise. Look at today. Okay, so anyway, let me, let me get started. Um, so this is referred to as the Baltimore plot. Um, it involves an attempt to assassinate Abraham Lincoln on his way to uh, Washington, D.C. after he was elected president. He, Abraham Lincoln was elected 16th president of the United States in November of 1860. When the final results were tallied, the leading candidate of the new fledgling Republican Party had won 39.8% of the popular vote and 59% of the electoral vote. The Democratic Party had split into northern and southern factions, and the Constitutional Union Party finished fourth. The country was divided, and Lincoln's election was proof of that, as he won the election without capturing a majority of the popular vote in an age where 81 percent, think about that, 81 percent of eligible voters had cast their ballots. In 1858, by the way, if you want a comparison, in 2016 it was 58 percent, the last election. In 1858, Republican candidate for the presidential nomination in 1860, William Henry Seward, declared that an irrepressible, in, irrepressible conflict was on its, w well on its way between a slave labor South and a free labor North. Lincoln himself had said that in the same year, that a house divided against itself cannot stand. The events of the 1850s brought the United States to the brink of civil war, a stronger fugitive slave law, Harriet Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, Bleeding Kansas, the Dred Scott Decision, and John Brown's raid at Harper's Ferry. Upon Lincoln's election, seven states in the Deep South seceded. Others south of the Mason-Dixon line watched and waited to see what Lincoln would say or do. Elected in November, Lincoln would not be sworn in into office until March 4th, uh, 1861, four months later, and big lag time here. Cautious as ever not to disrupt the country further, Lincoln made very few public statements as he was just the president-elect. As he prepared for his railroad journey, 2,000 miles to Washington, D.C., in February of 1861, Lincoln's trip took on added meaning. On the 11th of February, one day before his birthday, he addressed his hometown's crowd in Springfield, uh, uh, before a group of well-wishers at the Great Western Depot. There, let me read that little quick speech. My friends, no one, not in my situation, can appreciate my feeling of sadness at this parting. To this place and the kindness of these people, I owe everything. Here I have lived a quarter of a century and have passed from a young to an old man. Here my children have been born and one is buried. I now leave, not knowing when or whether I may return. 
to a task before me greater than that which rested upon Washington. Without the assistance of that divine being who ever attended him, I cannot succeed. With that assistance, I cannot fail. Trusting in him who can go with me and remain with you and be everywhere for good, let us confidently hope that all will be well. To his care commending you, as I hope in your prayers you will commend me, I bid you an affectionate farewell. Lincoln was truly eloquent and keenly aware of the task remaining ahead of him. Meanwhile, at the same time, Jefferson Davis was proceeding on to Montgomery, Alabama to assume his role as president of the Confederate States of America. Lincoln was also aware of the danger confronting him and the risks that both his journey to Washington and his inauguration may face. While living in Springfield, Illinois, and having just been elected president, he received at least a dozen pieces of hate mail each day. Example, threats like hanging, burning, decapitating, decapitation and flogging. His soul, family, and fellow abolitionists, Lincoln was not an abolitionist at this time, was damned to hell, were damned to hell. A young uh, Louisiana Creole calling himself Beware warned, you will be shot on the 4th of March, 1861. By a Louisiana Creole, we are decided and our aim is sure. According to his personal secretary, John Nicolay, who would also accompany Lincoln on his train, Mr. Lincoln could hardly imagine such dastardly thoughts or actions and as a result dismissed them as extremist views. Lincoln took more rational threats more seriously. Major David Hunter, a West Point graduate, wrote to the president-elect that an assassination threat by some young men in Virginia was being organized. Hunter urged him to enlist supporters to travel in advance of the inaugural to D.C. for the president's protection. While tra trying to organize the 100,000 men that Hunter said would be needed for his trip, Mr. Lincoln requested that Hunter accompany him on his inaugural train. Lincoln's thought that that 100,000 numbers and 100,000 men would be seemingly too difficult and much too unrealistic. Hunter had agreed to travel with Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Seward wanted to leave Springfield. He wanted Lincoln to leave Springfield even earlier than Lincoln had planned come in by surprise without announcement. Lincoln refused. The Electoral College vote would not be done until February. Such a, such a move might result in unnecessary provocation by Lincoln's political opponents. Because there was no single rail line that could carry the president from Springfield to Washington, he would be required to change lines and cars frequently, thus having to travel in an open carriage or even walk briefly to the next leg of his journey. Lincoln also insisted on making several public stops and speeches so that his countrymen could meet him. When it was suggested that a martial cortege accompany the train along the route, the president flatly refused. It would serve as a signal of the sort of warlike posture he had been at pains to avoid, according to Dan Stashower, the historian whose, basic bo whose book on this, The Hour of Peril, is really, really good and used this a lot for my work today. Anyway, John Nicolay remarked that Lincoln could not do his duty if he, was, if he shut himself in an iron box. When it appeared that the Buchanan administration had done little to secure the route to Washington, it was decided that an independent security firm be engaged for such a purpose. That firm belonged to Alan Pinkerton, private railroad detective from Chicago. Alan Pinkerton emigrated to the United States from Scotland in 1842 and settled in Dundee, Illinois, where he worked as a cooper. Despite his hard work, he was not generating a sufficient income. Intrigued by an illegal counterfeit ring near his farm, a little hard to believe, but anyway, he aided the local sheriff in capturing the offenders and received quite a bit of notoriety for the event. At this moment in his life, he decided to become a detective. Upon being offered the job of deputy sheriff of Cook County, Pinkerton relocated to Chicago, where he later established his own detective agency in 1850. After building a staff of detectives, Pinkerton established branch offices all over the Midwest. His business expanded with the growth of railroads as trains became increasingly subject to thefts and robberies. As the nation moves closer to civil war, Pinkerton's abolitionist sympathies grew. 
As he traveled increasingly throughout the South on business, he became alarmed about the views found in the Southern press as it related to secession and possibilities of violence against the president-elect. One of the leading railroad executives in the East at that time of Lincoln's inaugural was Samuel Morse Felton, president of the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. As the date of the inauguration drew closer in January of 1861, Felton also became convinced of a conspiracy to prevent Lincoln's arrival in Washington. Ms. Dorothea Dix, the famous prison reformer, had visited Mr. Felton and alerted him to a southern plot to topple the government of the United States. This plot would disrupt all train travel between Washington and the North. Felton communicated his conversation communicated his conversation with Miss Dix to General Winfield Scott, now in charge of the, of the U.S. Army in Washington, and also sent a letter to Alan Pinkerton asking for his assistance. Pinkerton arrived at Felton's office two days later. Much of Felton's railroad was located in Maryland, which surrounded Washington, D.C., on three sides. At the time of Lincoln's election, Maryland was a southern state that had chosen not to secede. It did, however, have plenty of Southern sympathizers. At the moment, there was no specific proof of a defined plot against the railroad or Mr. Lincoln's life. Pinkerton believed that it was critical to plant agents in saloons, hotels, houses of prostitution, and billiard halls in the event that details of such plans were discussed. Felton approved of, Link of Pinkerton's plans, sent male and female agents throughout the region to gather information. As Pinkerton's agents started to work undercover, it became increasingly clear that Baltimore was the prime location for, a, for possible trouble. First, Baltimore was the nation's fourth largest city. Second, there was strong pro-slavery sentiment there. Third, and perhaps most importantly, Baltimore was a central railroad hub where three distinct lines converged but were not connected by common track. This is also the time when the railroad gauge was not standardized, as so some trains had wider track than the others. Any route taken from Pennsylvania or New York toward D.C. would have to come through Baltimore. On January 27, 1861, President-elect Lincoln published his itinerary for the inaugural train, whose route up to that moment had been only rumored. Lincoln affirmed his wish to make frequent stops along the way to greet the public. The major stops from Springfield to Washington included Indianapolis, Cincinnati, Cleveland, Buffalo, Albany, New York City, Philadelphia, Harrisburg, and Baltimore. Lincoln wished to avoid elaborate ceremonies, and by traveling in open fashion, Lincoln would lay emphasis on the continuity of the government of the United States, as well as the legitimacy of his own election. This is Stashauer saying that. As plans for the inaugural trip were finalized, small towns were added to the itinerary, with Lincoln making as many as a dozen speeches in one day, often from the back of a railroad car. The man in charge of coordinating the railroad journey was William Wood, a longtime railroad expert from New York. He planned it so, plot, so that pilot engines would be sent in advance of the presidential train to scout for obstructions or hidden hazards and that the presidential train would have exclusive use of the road on the lines for the trip. In charge of security for the trip, was Elmer Ellsworth, Lincoln's uh, young law clerk from Springfield. Ellsworth had already established his Zouab unit of volunteers that would travel with the president until Lincoln vetoed the idea. Ellsworth had become a faithful employee, an energetic campaigner, and like a son to the president-elect. Ellsworth would accompany, the, uh, would accompany Lincoln on the inaugural special, but his men would not be joining him. Other personal friends uh, uh, rounded out the complement of the men dedicated to Lincoln's safety. They were Illinois State Senator Norman Judd, Judge David Davis, and Ward Hill Lehman, all from Illinois. The most physically imposing of these men was Lehman. He stood over six feet tall and weighed close to 300 pounds. He carried several pistols, a set of brass knuckles, a large bowie knife, and a blackjack. It was clear that if there was a threat against the president-elect, Lehman would be able to respond to that threat. Talk across the nation continued to grow about the possibility of Union troops invading southern soil. Southern sympathizers in Maryland were pushing that state toward secession in February, after Mr. Lincoln's train left Springfield. 
Alan Pinkerton now joined his agents there, posing as a stockbroker named Hutchinson. In Baltimore, he befriended a businessman named James Luckett. Luckett had been chosen to be a convention delegate that would decide Maryland's future as to, whether, as to either a Union or a Confederate state. He preferred the latter. Pinkerton convinced Luckett that his views were the same and were alike regarding that topic and confirmed it with a gift of $25 for the cause. So there's a little bit of bait there. Pinkerton giving him money saying, I'm with you. At this time, Luckett mentioned Lincoln's upcoming trip through Baltimore. Luckett, believing that Pinkerton was sincere, suggested that a handful of men were being organized to help the cause and that their leader was Captain Cipriana Ferrandini, a local secessionist and barber. He had become leader of a local militia group called the National Volunteers. He vowed that Maryland militiamen would prevent Northern volunteers from passing through the state. Luckett also admitted that Lincoln would not be allowed to pass through Baltimore. Luckett said Ferrandini would kill him. Pinkerton, whom Luckett said he would introduce to Ferrandini, decided to send a telegram to Norman Judd ahead of the arrival of Lincoln's train in Indianapolis. In Indianapolis, Mary Lincoln joined her husband on board the train. Along the route, Lincoln gave short speeches and shook hands with well-wishers. He often stopped over, stay, stay, stayed overnight in public places, further energizing the crowds that awaited him and worrying those who chose to protect him. Meanwhile, in Baltimore, Pinkerton as Hutchinson met Ferrandini. Based on Luckett's assessment of Hutchinson, the Italian shared his conviction that Lincoln must be killed so that Maryland could secede and then lead the South to victory over the Union. Ferrandini, inspired by Italy's own revolution years earlier, pledged, If I alone must do it, I shall. Lincoln shall die in this city. But before Pinkerton could gather details about a specific plan, two men approached their table and the would-be assassin clammed up and left soon afterwards. Pinkerton needed to reach the Lincoln train as quickly as possible. He sent his own agent, William Scott, to meet the Lincoln special in Cincinnati. The train schedule as it was uh, printed in the newspaper made it easier for Pinkerton to locate it. Scott reached Cincinnati by train at 2 a.m. on February 13th. Judd was staying overnight at the Burnett house when Scott arrived, but the desk clerk refused to disturb him as Judd had left instructions to not be disturbed. When Scott delivered Pinkerton's letter the following morning, Judd became visibly shaken and disturbed by the threat to Lincoln's life. Pinkerton concluded by wishing to arrange a face-to-face -face meeting when possible. Judd promised to not share the letter's co contents with anyone until Pinkerton could confirm the details with Judd and others in person. While the electoral votes were being counted in Washington, a congressional committee studying alleged hostile organizations in Washington had finally concluded there was no threat in D.C. against the government, despite early concerns to the contrary. With Lincoln's election officially affirmed without incident in Washington, General Winfield Scott, by the way, had pledged that the U.S. Army was ready to meet any possible threat should one arise. That did not happen. The Lincoln special steamed into western Pennsylvania. Lincoln felt rejuvenated by both the news of the Electoral College vote and the crowds that grew in size at every stop. Meanwhile, in Westfield, New Jersey, further east, south of Buffalo, Abraham Lincoln got to meet a young 11-year-old girl named Grace Bedell, which I hope you know the story, who had written the president that a set of whiskers might improve both his popularity and his appearance. When the two finally met, Lincoln picked her up and kissed her and said, You see, I let these whiskers grow for you. Nice. Alan Pinkerton was unable to pick up Ferrandini's tra trail after the barber had suddenly departed their meeting. While at Barnum's Hotel, he met George P. Kane, the recently selected marshal of Baltimore's police, police force. Kane had been on the job for about a year. Kane was aware that a group of Republicans were planning to greet the president-elect when, when his train arrived at the Calvert Station in Baltimore. When the group applied for police protection, Kane urged them to abandon their plan. Kane thought that even a military escort would be too provocative as well. Kane did say that he would protect Lincoln's safety, but because he was, quote, a strong advocate for secession, Pinkerton could and would not trust him. As a result of Pinkerton's agent's work, Pinkerton began to piece together parts of a conspiratorial plot to assassinate Mr. Lincoln.
Upon Lincoln's arrival at Calvert Station, a disturbance would unfold and draw attention of the police who would be gathered there for security reasons. Once the ruckus began, an assassin would emerge along with his companions to shoot the president-elect and make their escape. The man who developed this plan was, in fact, the Italian barber Cipriano Ferrandini. Otis Hillard, a lieutenant of the Palmetto Guard, Palmetto's the, the uh, palmetto trees are in South Carolina. He had a palmetto tree on his uh, tattoo on his chest. One of the secret military societies formed in Baltimore. He had befriended Pinkerton agent Harry Davies, whom he met at a local house of prostitution. Davies had worked his way into Hillard's confidence for the last several weeks, discussing the glory that was coming for, uh, for uh, the glory that was coming for ascension if any Southerners were brave enough to kill Lincoln and prevent uh, his ascension sorry, to the highest office in the land. Finally, convincing Hillard that he too was a loyal son of the South, Davies got his friend to share Ferrandini's plans to kill Lincoln. Hillard took Davies to meet the barber. Where, uh, at the time when Hillard took Davies to the meeting, Davies was sworn in. Davies was sworn in and took up an oath of loyalty to participate in the plans. So and now one of Pinkerton's guards has infiltrated the, plot, the plotters. Before the meeting broke up, lots were drawn to see which conspirator would do the deed. The one chosen drew a lot with a red mark on it. To ensure the success of the act, not one but eight lots had a red mark on them, so neither one knew that the others were involved. The Lincoln Special steamed across New York State with major stops in Albany and New York City, where one year earlier Lincoln had delivered the speech that made him president, the Cooper Union Address. While in New York City, Lincoln stayed at the Astor House on Lower Broadway. One morning, February 19th, a young woman arrived at the hotel looking for Mr. Judd. Her name was Kate Warren, one of Alan Pinkerton's agents who had a message to deliver from her boss. Judd and Pinkerton were to meet in person so that, they could, so that he could bring them up to speed about the details of the assassination plot in Baltimore. When Judd suggested that he notify the New York City Police Department and others responsible for Lincoln's safety, Warren urged and urgently pleaded with him to do no such thing. Pinkerton agents are in the field. They could be compromised if word got out. While still in New York City, another Pinkerton telegram arrived. Baltimore bookies were taking bets that Lincoln would not make it out of the city alive. Before taking the train to back to Baltimore, Mrs. Warren notified Mr. Judd that Pinkerton would meet him in Philadelphia. Unbeknownst to Pinkerton, New York City police chief, oddly enough named John Kennedy, who had done an excellent job protecting the president-elect while in New York. He dispatched three of his own detectives to Baltimore when he found out via a recent trip to D.C. that Lincoln's life may be in danger. So now we've got both Kennedy and Pinkerton with two separate reports about a plot in Baltimore. The, list of Kennedy's, the last of Kennedy's staff to arrive in Baltimore was David S. Bookstaver traveling as a music agent to elicit possible threats to Lincoln from Baltimore's upper class. Within days of Lincoln's arrival, he was convinced that a serious danger of violence existed. He immediately voiced concern with Kennedy's contact in Washington, Colonel Charles Stone, who then informed General Scott directly. Lincoln's train was just two days from Baltimore. Stone and Scott knew that a change to the traveling arrangements was now necessary. Convincing Lincoln to change plans would not be easy. Scott sent a note to William Seward, New York senator and former Lincoln political rival who had also expressed concerns about Lincoln's safety. Scott could not leave Washington and the telegraph could be compromised. So he asked Fred Seward, William Henry Seward's son, to deliver the message to his father in the Senate chamber. Once delivered, William Henry Seward directed his son to take the train to Philadelphia and tell Mr. Lincoln himself. As the Lincoln special made its way to Philadelphia, he stopped by Trenton, New Jersey, where he spoke of Washington's influence on his own impoverished life. At the New Jersey State House, he recalled the victory at Trenton and the importance of our victory during the American Revolution. I am exceedingly anxious that this union, this constitution, and the liberties of the people shall be perpetuated in, in accordance with the original idea for which that struggle was made. My God, Lincoln is just a beautiful writer, probably the best. When Alan Pinkerton arrived in Philadelphia, he met with Samuel Felton 
at the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. Pinkerton told him all the details of the Lincoln assassination plot in Baltimore that he had learned so far. Pinkerton believed that about 20 or so conspirators were directly involved. If successful, he told Felton, it was also likely that his railroad would be destroyed in order to prevent any retaliation for the plot by northern soldiers. The Lincoln Special arrived in Philadelphia shortly after Pinkerton had shared his concerns with Felton. Pinkerton's agent, George Burns, George Burns, delivered a message to Mr. Judd that he should meet Pinkerton in his room at the St. Louis Hotel. Once there, Judd listened intently as Pinkerton laid out the details of the plot and urged a change to the president's travel itinerary. Most disconcerting to Pinkerton was the need for Lincoln to pass in Baltimore from one rail line to another, having to ride in a carriage where his life was even at greater risk. To safeguard the president, Pinkerton wanted Lincoln to take the train directly to Washington that night in order to arrive safely. Problems. Lincoln planned to mark George Washington's birthday the next day, raising the flag at Independence Hall, and then traveling to Harrisburg to speak to the state legislature there. That first night in Philadelphia, Judd arranged a meeting between himself, Lincoln, and Pinkerton in Judd's hotel room. Lincoln, Lincoln, Lincoln recognized Pinkerton since his days at the Illinois Central Railroad. Pinkerton laid out three possible scenarios against the president-elect. One, a fatal train derailment. Two, an explosive device aboard the rail car that Lincoln was riding in. And the most likely, three, an organized disturbance when Lincoln arrived, rode through the streets of, of Baltimore via carriage from Calvert Street from the Calvert Street Station to the B&O Railroad Depot several blocks away. The last option seemed most likely as early as in, er, based on earlier reports. Pinkerton later noted the President's immediate response was an expression of regret that Southern secessionists could think that his death would in any major way enhance their cause. When the conversation ended, Lincoln got up from his chair and said he refused to leave Philadelphia. He said he wasn't going to leave. He had two commitments ahead of him that he was unwilling to break, raising the flag in Independence Hall the next day in his remarks before the state legislature in Harrisburg. Once these were done, he, would th he was willing to alter his trip to the nation's capital. Before going to bed, Mr. Lincoln met with Fred Seward, who having just arrived, confirmed the threat that Pinkerton discussed, now confirmed by another reputable source. It appears that Lincoln did take these threats seriously, after all, since leaving Springfield, those reports continued to be raised only in more general terms. To Pinkerton, Lincoln appeared calm and resolute in the face of such threats. Both men had a duty to perform, and both were aware of the risks. The next morning, February 21st, 1861, George Washington's birthday, Abraham Lincoln met the crowd of 30,000 people which had gathered at Independence Hall the birthplace of the United States and its founding document, the Declaration of Independence. While celebrating the occasion, Lincoln delivered a short address. Okay, and I'm going to read that address to you because I think it really tells you what was on Lincoln's mind at the time. I am filled with deep emotion at finding myself standing here in this place where, where were collected together the wisdom, the patriotism, the devotion to principle, from which sprang the institutions under which we live. You have kindly suggested to me that in my hands is the task of restoring peace to the present distracted condition of the country. I can say in return, sir, that all the political sentiments I have entertained have been drawn, so far as I have been able to draw them, from the sentiments which originated and were given to the world from this hall. I have never had a feeling politically that did not spring from sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. I have often pondered over the dangers which were occurred, incurred by the men who assembled here and framed and adopted that Declaration. Remember, their lives were on the line as well. I have pondered over the toils that were endured by the officers and soldiers of the Army who achieved that independence. I have often inquired of myself what great principle or idea it was that kept this Confederacy so long together. It was not the mere matter of the separation of the colonies from the motherland, but the sentiment in the Declaration which gave liberty, not alone to the people of this country, but I hope to the world for, the future time, for all future time. So Lincoln knew what was at stake. It was not just America, it was the future of democracy. 
It was that which, we, he, which gave promise that in due time the weight should be lifted from the shoulders of all men. This is a sentiment embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Now, my friends, can this country be saved upon that basis? If it can, I will consider myself one of the happiest men in the world if I can help to save it. If it cannot be saved upon that principle, it will be truly awful. But if this country cannot be saved without giving up that principle. Lincoln then said, I would rather be assassinated on this spot and surrender his responsibility to the Constitution of the United States. He then removed his coat, raised the American flag, which follow, was followed by patriotic music and a soldier's volley. For Pinkerton, to get Lincoln through Baltimore safely, he needed to keep any further alterations in the President-elect's itinerary safe so as not to alert any possible conspirators who might be present along the route. The Lincoln train pulled out of Philadelphia at 9.30 a.m. for the four-hour, 100-mile trip to Harrisburg. Once in Harrisburg, certain members of Lincoln's security detail and an entourage were given the plans as to what was to transpire once the Lincoln Special left that city. At the Jones, Hotel, Jones House Hotel in Harrisburg, later that day, Judd assembled Davis, Hunter, Captain John Pope, who would later be a Civil War general, and Lehman to explain the last phase of Lincoln's trip to Washington while Mr. Lincoln sat in on the meeting. Lincoln would travel ahead of schedule under Pinkerton's protection. As details of Pinkerton's and Kennedy's research was shared, some saw the change of plans as an act of cowardice, while others thought it necessary. Judge Davis, calming things down a bit, asked Lincoln what he thought on the subject. Based on the two independent reports given, and while appreciating the risk of ridicule, Lincoln backed Judd's plan. Only two men would accompany Lincoln to Washington, Mr. Pinkerton and Mr. Lehman. Finally, Lincoln needed to confide in his wife about the plan as his sudden absence from the party that evening might cause undue attention and speculation. When she was told at dinner, she became quite upset and so loud she nearly ruined the plans. One dinner guest, Pennsylvania Senator Alexander McClure, later noted that Lincoln did have doubts about such a clandestine move. What would the nation think of its president stealing into the Capitol like a thief in the night? Despite these reservations, Lincoln left the hotel, changed into an old overcoat, put on a soft beaver hat, and stepped into a carriage unnoticed by onlookers and accompanied by laymen. Two reporters expecting to see Lincoln that evening looked for him, but said they couldn't find the president-elect. A gentleman approached them, according to Pinkerton, and said he, he had already left the city and was on his way to Washington. When the two reporters headed for the door so they could get the story out over the wire their respect, to their respective newspapers, the gentleman, a Pinkerton agent, stopped them at the door, waving his two pistols, told them that they could not leave until Mr. Lincoln's safety was assured. In exchange for staying until morning, they were promised the story that became known as the Baltimore Plot. It is now Saturday morning, February 23rd. According to schedule, Lincoln's inaugural train was due to arrive in Baltimore at 12.30 in the afternoon at the Calvert Station. 10 to 15,000 people were waiting, along with members of the National Volunteers. Hillard was there along with Davies. Hillard told Davies that with so many people present, it would make it very easy to assassinate the president to accomplish their task. Police would be present, but they would not interfere, Hillard said. As noon approached, rumors were everywhere that Lincoln was already in D.C. Maybe his train was just late. Hillard looked for his fellow conspirators, but to no avail. As he came to realize that the rumor of Lincoln's arrival in D.C. were true, Hillard correctly predicted that such a secret move into the Capitol would brand Lincoln a coward, and it will help our cause. The new Lincoln administration released no official explanation and left opinions to the public and the press. An interesting perspective came from Frederick Douglass, who as a slave knew of such risks requiring clandestine travels at night in order to escape danger, meaning slaves, for example. Others mocked Lincoln's escape and put him in a Scottish cap and disguise to portray him as a coward. And there's a very famous picture of Abraham Lincoln in a cartoon hopping off a freight car wearing a, wearing a Scottish cap disguised as a sailor who's ready to step off the car, and there's a cat that's reared its back, and Lincoln appears to be scared and frightened. Uh, one, uh, Southern newspapers claimed he exchanged his clothes for one of his wife's outfits. <laughs> 
and came through Baltimore wearing a dress. By the way, the, ball, the, the Union press would get back near the end of the war when they would say that Jefferson Davis was disguised running away dressed as a woman. And so that wasn't true, but those stories were out there, of course. Um, odd that, that people use untruths to try to get people roused about their opponents. Anyway, either side. Finally, the Baltimore Sun lambasted the president for disrespecting the office that he would assume was such a stunt. According to historian Dan Stoshauer, whose, report, uh, whose book is the basis for the talk today, the act undid much of what Lincoln was trying to accomplish by speaking of openness, national unity, and building up public sentiment for the difficult days ahead, something the president would later uh, attempt uh, in his first inaugural address. And I think the other, the other way to look at it was there was a plot. They did know about it. Moving Lincoln was protecting his safety, and that the, the, the fact that there was a plot is proof that Lincoln needed security and safety to be able to do this. But, of course, the debate is going to continue. Okay, so what happened to Lincoln's train, and how did he get to D.C.? Pinkerton, with Felton's assistant, held up a special train for a package that kept the train in the station in Philadelphia until the package arrived. This was a decoy. It contained nothing but worthless railroad reports. The actual route of the train had been changed, not Harrisburg to Baltimore, but Harrisburg to Philadelphia, where Lincoln would change trains to the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad that would pass from Philadelphia through Baltimore to D.C., going on a different route, avoiding conspirators. To avoid the attention of, special president of, the pres of a special presidential car, Lincoln would have to ride an irregular passage car, passenger car at night in a sleeping compartment with curtains drawn. To prevent riders from filling up all the sleeping cars, Mrs. Warren bribed a conductor to keep one open for her invalid brother. That happened to be the president. All telegraph wires were cut between Harris and Baltimore, Harrisburg and Baltimore to keep Lincoln's uh, travel plan secret. Few stops were made. Trains were pushed to the limit. Little comfort was available for Lincoln in his travel at this time and little food available for those who rode with him. Lincoln's train for Philadelphia actually arrived early, so Lincoln traveled in a closed carriage with Pinkerton and Lehman until the train could leave for Baltimore. They kind of rode around the city, and of course Pinkerton was very nervous about this. Um, anyway, uh, at the when Lincoln's train did finally arrive and they could leave for Baltimore, they had to cross the Susquehanna River, which at this time there were not rail a railroad bridge or tracks to carry him over, so they actually had to put the railroad cars on a barge to Maryland, on, I think it's Havre de Grace, and Pinkerton, and, and, and then ferry them over and then reconnect them. Pinkerton agents kept a lookout on both sides of the river. Lincoln's train arrived at Baltimore at 3.30 in the morning, where railroad workers decoupled the sleeping car and attached it to a team of horses that pulled it toward the Cam Camden Street station one mile away. So there wasn't that connecting railroad. They literally had to pull it. Horses had to pull the car. Despite the smooth results up to this point, the B&O train to D.C. arrived late in Baltimore after the sun rose. So now they're getting very nervous. Unless it arrived soon, only Pinkerton and Lehman were there to protect the president-elect. When it finally arrived at last, and I couldn't get a time, I didn't get a time from the book, Lincoln could complete the last leg of his trip to D.C. When Lincoln's train finally arrived in Washington, Lincoln was greeted by Elihu Washburn, a close friend and member of the United States Senate. Lincoln was not immediately recognizable until passengers disembarked from the sleeping car at the end of the train. As Washburn greeted Lincoln, Pinkerton didn't know who he was, so Pinkerton punched him and knocked him down. What an embarrassing act from this guy who was overprotective of the president not knowing who Elihu Washburn was. Lincoln arrived at the Willard Hotel early but the suite reserved for him was occupied. So, boy, you really have to think about all the details going on. Lincoln met uh, Winfield Scott at his hotel and thanked him in person for his efforts to protect his life. Scott's support for Lincoln and his commitment to Lincoln's safety meant a lot coming from a long-serving U.S. war hero. Scott had been a war hero in, in the war against Mexico in the War of 1812. Meanwhile, what happened in Baltimore? The Lincoln Special arrived in Baltimore and uh, about little after, little, little after 12.30, amidst joy and angst. The mayor and the chief of police were present for the arrival, even though Lincoln was not. Mrs. Lincoln avoided the crowd scene and stayed over with her family at a private home, 
in Baltimore, Colonel John Giddings, um, president of the Northern Central Railroad. Pinkerton prepared to return to Baltimore to continue his work and investigate existing and future threats. Lehman talked to reporters, which Pinkerton took exception to. Names of people would expose his men to danger. Pinkerton thought Lehman was seeking notoriety for himself. And this is an ongoing debate after Lincoln's death that these two men are going to have it out in the press. Volunteers wishing to revenge the traitors that foiled the plot. There were these volunteers now were angry that their plot had been foiled and now wanted revenge. Two of John Kennedy's New York City detectives literally had to jump from a moving train to save themselves. When the Baltimore plot fizzled out, Pinkerton offered his service and those of his company to the U.S. government. Elmer Ellsworth, Lincoln's law clerk from Mechanicville, New York, by the way, is buried in Mechanicville, of the Bendewis grave site, was in Alexandria, Virginia now on May 23rd, so it's after Lincoln, after the inaugural, five weeks after the firing on Fort Sumter. When the Marshall House there hung a Confederate flag atop its roof, visible from the White House, Ellsworth went up there and took it down only be shot in the chest by the hotel owner as Ellsworth walked down the stairs. There was an exhibit at the, uh, um, at the New York Historical Society called Lincoln in New York, and they actually have the coat that was worn in the shot that hit Ellsworth in the chest. Um, he became the first Union officer to die in the line of duty. Funeral ceremonies were held in the White House as Lincoln mourned over the loss of his young friend. When the first Union troops from Massachusetts traveled through Baltimore on their way to D.C., they were hit with rocks and bottles and shots of lead. Widespread violence broke out despite the efforts of Mayor Brown and Marshall Kane to stop it. So the violence is definitely was an issue. Secession fever in Baltimore increased as calls for resistance grew. Lincoln now tried to avoid Baltimore uh, as a route for northern troops to pass through. But he needed Maryland as a, northern, as a, as a Union state because it had not seceded. So the best way to avoid any further conflict is to avoid Baltimore altogether and begin sending troops by boat rather than by train. Meanwhile, General Benjamin Butler of Massachusetts, seeking to avenge the earlier attack um, on Massachusetts troops in Baltimore, brought a 1,000 soldiers and aimed cannons at Baltimore's shipyards and business district. He then quickly declared martial law and kept the peace. Despite being relieved of command by General Scott, Lincoln appointed him to the rank of Major General. Maryland never left the Union, and Brown and Kane were sent to prison after arrest by Pinkerton and his men. Riding in violence in Baltimore proved justification for Lincoln's travel change. Ferrandini, Hillard, and others were never arrested or questioned. Pinkerton wrote in his memoirs that they sought safety in flight after the plot failed. Ferrandini did return to Baltimore where he lived until his death until 1910. Why not follow up on this critical event in American history at the time? The immediacy of the event led to war a month later, so everybody was caught up in the coming of the Civil War. Not wishing to uh, draw attention to the event that could rekindle embarrassment for Mr. Lincoln was another reason in the attempt, as I said earlier, to make sure that Baltimore, or that Maryland stays in the Union. Alan Pinkerton performed a valuable service to his country, helped him foil the plot, captured Confederate spy Rose Greenow. In a negative way, unfortunately for, for Pinkerton, he became a scout for, uh, for Union, uh, Union officer George McClellan, uh, who actually had a very difficult time trying to mobilize, uh, get his men, great at organizing and moving his men, uh, not moving his men, but organizing his men and drilling his men, but never easy to want to engage. And we think part of the problem was that Pinkerton, not being a military expert, did not have the intelligence capability to be able to accurately identify Confederate troop movements. So as a result, McClellan, McClellan often hesitated, which usually gave Lee the time to respond effectively. And so it's interesting that, unfortunately, um, this is what became of Pinkerton's wartime experience. In fact, to the point that it actually was Pinkerton that became, became a spy for McClellan against Lincoln, trying to figure out who McClellan's enemies were and what Lincoln was going to do. Another problem. Okay. Um, conclusion. Let it be said that Abraham Lincoln, it would be sad, though, that we remember that Lincoln would die of an assassin's bullet, John Wilkes Booth, who was, oddly enough, a Baltimore resident who used to hang out at the same Barnum's Hotel that a lot of these other early conspirators were hanging out in.
it was, it's a glad thing that Lincoln pursued his responsibility as president with equal determination and strength in the belief and the promise of American democracy, ultimately paying for it with his life. After the war ended, Pinkerton and Lehman, actually to some degree John Kennedy, engaged in a war of words over whose narrative of the Baltimore plot would be remembered. Pinkerton resented Lehman for outing him in the press and not going after Ferrandini. In the end, results are what matters. Pinkerton and his agents, men and women, averted an early assassination threat against a newly elected president during the time of our greatest national crisis. Despite his later reputation, as far as the Baltimore plot is concerned, he did his duty and did it well. Thank you very much. Okay. I can entertain or any questions or comments to be made. Greta. That, that 1860 election must have been very interesting. How many states had seceded by 1860? Se upon Lincoln's election, seven. seven. And once Lincoln, once Lincoln ordered that troops be, that he, he called in his 80-day emergency war measures, called for troops, the other four states seceded after that. So the seven. Were included in the electoral college vote? Uh, they were at the time the election occurred, yes. But it didn't after that, right? Yeah. Okay. So how did Jefferson Davis get declared president of the Confederacy? Well, the, once the South decided to secede and leave the Union, they created Montgomery, Alabama, and then did what what they did in order to secede. What many states did, like Maryland, ultimately did and decided not to, was to call conventions in each of their states, deciding whether or not to secede. Once they decided to secede, they sent delegates then to go to Alabama to Montgomery to create a Confederate constitution and elect Jefferson Davis as president. Davis was elected to a one-term, six-year term, but of course the Confederacy didn't last six years. Only lasted four, more or less. Anyone else? Yeah, Chris. Okay, that's right. Right. Correct. Pinkerton. Because Pinkerton was Scottish. He was a Scottish immigrant. So it's kind of like a Pinkerton-esque disguise to put him in a Scottish hat. Try to embarrass him. The guy who did that, by the way, was from Baltimore. His name was Albert Voke. He was a Baltimore dentist and a secessionist. That was to purposely throw a dig at Pinkerton. Were there Go ahead. More plots that were oh, there were, yeah, there were. I mean, there were plots, for example, during the war... Uh, there were plots to, in, to uh, if you want to talk general plots against the North, to bring in deadly disease into New York City. Confederate plots actually to kidnap the president. Booth was part of an earlier plan to hold Lincoln hostage in exchange for Confederate prisoners. That fell apart when Lincoln didn't make a trip that he was bound to make, and so Booth's men lost that opportunity. And by then, as the war drew to a close, Booth had decided to change his plan to killing Lincoln. And what Booth does is Booth then, then creates a diary and a statement to be sent to newspapers identifying the men in his plan so that if any of them got cold feet and wanted to back out, he said, it's too late because I've already sent this letter that's, you know, or get this letter going that will implicate you. So, anything else? Go ahead. You get three. That's good. Go ahead. You got one more. I'm only kidding. Huh? Oh, sure, yeah, so uh, so let me see. So Chris's first question was um, about, about the cap and the cartoon of Lincoln coming into Baltimore. That was a Scottish cap. That was an attempt to dig at Pinkerton, right? And Chris's next question was, were there any other further plots? There were plenty, and they had to do that. What is really neat, and I read there's a great book that just came out called Lincoln's Spies about how the U.S. government finally created a system to gather intelligence not just about from, from, from captured prisoners, from prisoners of war, from escaped slaves, as well as military intelligence to create a coordinated strategy to be able to defeat the Confederacy. That was significant, and the guy responsible for that is General George Sharp from New York of the 120th Regiment who's buried in Kingston. My wife and I managed to go visit his grave in the Wiltwick Rural Cemetery right in the center of town. Pretty cool. Okay. And let's see, in your last question, Chris. Uh, 
Right, yeah. Why wasn't that uncovered, or was it, and they just didn't give it Yeah, uh, so the question was, why didn't the, the spies or, or the intelligence operation in the, in the, in, within the Union Army and within Lincoln's administration finally decide that Booth was a threat and capture him? I think a lot of it, unfortunately, had to do with opportunity. I mean, for example, um, John Wilkes Booth was an actor. Lincoln saw his, his brother, loved his, his brother was his, to split the, the Booth family, by the way. His brother was a devout unionist and John Wilkes Booth was a confederate. Um, but John Wilkes Booth, when, when Lincoln's, um, when the notice of Lincoln's attending the play at Ford's Theater was a perfect opportunity for Booth because Booth worked at the theater, had acted in the theater, nobody doubted his presence in the theater you know, because of given his reputation as an actor. And so you also have the fact that when John Parker was appointed to guard the president, that Pinkerton, that, that not Pinkerton, sorry, that Parker had actually left, we, we think he may have left his seat to either go get a drink or go watch the play, giving Booth the opportunity, because Booth had gone to the theater that day and carved a hole in the door to watch to be able to do that. And Lincoln himself essentially, in many ways, did not want uh, really too much security around him because he said, you know, I can't live in fear, number one, and number two, if somebody really wants to kill me, it's going to happen anyway. He really believed that. There's a fatalistic attitude that Lincoln carried. It's just so tragic, though, that it happened um, the way it was. So, Arlene. Who had a better spy network? Okay. Well, the question is, who had a better spy network, north or south? Definitely the north. Um, that didn't mean the South didn't. First of all, Robert E. Lee was a guy who really wanted to, to really work on strategy and really wasn't as concerned about gathering intelligence because he was an Army guy, and Army guys travel on the advice of their officers. And so for having men like Stonewall Jackson you know, and, um, and George Pickett out there leading cavalry units, he always felt as though the importance of his military information was always the best. Um, and to some degree, that may be true, but in terms of other types of information, that he didn't really want to rely on that and didn't give it much thought. I mean, there's a story about, an, about a slave who goes in to the Confederate White House and hears Jefferson Davis talk about things, but Davis, being so blinded by issues of race that black people can't understand or do anything proper, doesn't think she's a threat at all, and eventually some of the information she provides the Union Army is the Union government is is accurate. So, you know, there's that too. It's kind of interesting to think in those terms, but yeah. There was no secret service at the time. How was the president protected and how much emphasis did they place on that? Okay. Well, there so there was the question was there wasn't any secret service. How did they, you know, consider protection um, as an issue? Um, well, there, you're right, there wasn't, and it's something that's going to evolve during the war. And part of it has to do with General Sharp, as I mentioned, and the willingness of other people within the Army to protect the President. I mean, there are times where Lincoln will go out on his own, you know, and people have to hurry to kind of get to him. He's, at one point, he's inspecting troops, and he almost gets his hat, his hat is shot off. You know, so he's got to be real careful. Um, so it's not really until... You know, the, really, the, so it begins with, I think it really begins with Pinkerton's early stages. It's a private a f private outfit that eventually does it in the beginning, and eventually it shifts over to the Army with men like George Sharp, Sharp and others gathering information, and eventually it's something that's going to evolve. And, of course, then you have later on, you have Garfield and McKinley, you know, who are shot also. So, you know, it's tough because you have a democracy where a president needs access to the people, and you also have clear threats that have to be challenged. So there was an attempt, at least, by the Union Army to try to protect them whenever possible. I mean, but if you think, like, I think about this um, as the defining moment in, for, in terms of Booth, right? It's April 11th, 1865, and Lincoln appears on the second floor balcony of the White House, and he's giving a speech. He doesn't normally give impromptu speeches, but he's talking about the end of the war and possible hope and help for African Americans. And he discusses the possibility of voting, of limited, the voting, them voting in limited numbers. John Wilkes Booth hears this and says that means citizenship. And he uses the N-word and then citizenship. And he said that's the last speech he'll ever give. So in some ways, Lincoln knew what he, stuck to what he was saying, believed in what he said, and paid for it with his life. 
which, you know, it's, democracy is precarious, and you need people willing to stand up in order to protect and preserve it, and problems of violence will always be a threat. And we see that. We see that now. Hopefully not, but anywhere. Yeah. Right. Yes. Okay, yeah, the Zouaves were, the question was, what was the Zouave unit? Zouaves were modeled after French soldiers fighting in, in Africa. And essentially what they had is they had a fez. They had a fez as a hat, and they had bloomers on for, like, pants and shorter jackets. And they thought they were really stylish. So, like a lot of people at the time, if your uniform looked good, people thought you were something special. So, Zou, uh, so Ellsworth created the Zouave unit that ultimately will be followed and picked up by other units. That basically, you know, infantrymen who were dressed in different uniforms looking like French soldiers. Anything else? Yes, Chris. Number four. Okay. He hit the bonus. Yes, go ahead. Right. Okay, so the question was, were there any threats against the life of the president before that? Well, how are we supposed to know unless they come forward? I don't know. I'm trying to think. I don't recall anything immediate, you know, other than perhaps, you know, George Washington becoming a target for the British, you know, given the, you know, given the nature of, uh, you know, of his position. But I, can't, I personally can't recall. I mean, there were rumors that Zachary Taylor was poisoned, right? That was a rumor, right, that Zachary Taylor had died suddenly. My understanding of Zachary Taylor is that there it was a July 4th celebration. They were offering, I think, I, I don't know if there's some people who said strawberries, some cucumbers and ice cream. You know, kind of the milk had gotten sour by sitting out. And he may have developed a stomach infection. But I think they actually exhumed um, Taylor's body and found arsenic, which was not unusual. Arsenic was used as a preservative. Theodore Roosevelt, as a young boy, kept arsenic in his house because he stuffed dead birds. That was not unusual, so I think they've eliminated that. But I can't recall off the top of my head anything to that, to that degree. I just don't know. Okay. All right, great. Well, listen, thank you folks very much. Stick around. And uh, sign Jim's card, please. Sign Jim Nelson's card. Thank you.